I love chapter 8, verses 17 through 27. You see the groaning of creation for glory. You see the groaning of believers for glory. And then you see the groaning of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, which is groaning with believers and is groaning with creation for redemption, for total redemption. We know what's going to happen. That's the hope we have. It gives us hope. It gives us purpose. It gives us confidence to know that the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing our glorification. It is all guaranteed. When you consider the word freedom, what's the very first thing that springs to mind? As Americans, it's most likely it will have something to do with your right as an individual and possibly breaking free of some kind of constraint or tyranny um, but if you look up the word and you'll find that the, the following definition, it is the power or the right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Obedience and dependence, being someone's slave, isn't likely to be the first or even the last thought when you consider the word freedom. Isn't that so typical of our God? to sort of, we think one way, and here's God in another place. Typical of how our faith and life after salvation can sometimes confound us. For the last several weeks, we have been considering Romans 8 and how freedom is joyful and satisfying obedience to God. And after laying out the struggles that we will have with sin in chapter 7, Paul has laid out for us a roadway as as John has pointed out, to freedom in the beginning part of chapter 8. Last week, John examined verses 12 through 17, where Paul is wrapping up his comments addressing our sin struggles and concluding that once we're in Christ, our ob obligations to our flesh have ceased. We're no longer obligated to our flesh. Now, it is not by some fantastical, magical, mystical kind of thing. It is by the spirit that we have after salvation that we have the enablement to overcome the power of sin. So today I have the privilege of addressing the context of possibly the second most quoted verse in all of Scripture. We won't get to verse 28 which is somewhat disappointing to me, if I were really honest. But we'll set the table for John so that he has it to really <laughs> expand upon next. And so, speaking of context, we here at Grace mostly examine entire books or chapters, as we are right now. And one of the reasons we approach Scripture in this manner is to guard us from helicoptering in to something that we really want out of Scripture without considering it in its context. So for those of us that are really fond of sort of quoting 828, we're going to talk about the context for that. Beginning in verse 18, Paul switches gears. He's transitioning away from our struggles with sin, and he lays for us this word picture of a glorious future. And as we'll see, more important than even what will happen, will happen in the future. He explains the certainty of God's presence by his spirit for each of us. And how by his spirit he will see us through to that future. John MacArthur, when speaking on today's passage, commented, and I'm going to quote here, we claim to worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And somehow, the Holy Spirit has been trailing behind in terms of emphasis over the last century. When in reality, the Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity most personally and intimately involved in the life of a believer. Paul said it a little differently in Philippians 1.6, being confident of, this, confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion 
until the day of Christ. So we have a truly amazing passage here, but many of you weren't here last week, and uh, it, it, I think it's important for us to repeat something, that in your flesh, you do not have the ability to overcome sin. This is important. In your flesh, you do not have the ability to overcome sin. It's not something that God expects you to muster up, to be good. If we are in Christ, we have the power to overcome sin struggles. And as we'll see this morning, it is only by the power and working of the Spirit that we can be held in the center of God's will for us. It is only that. I looked it up. It's, and I'm not familiar of any other passage in it. Those of you that I challenge to be Berean, this is one of your opportunities to kind of go after it. I'm not aware of any passage in Scripture where 22 times the Spirit is mentioned in 27 verses. It's unbelievable. So let's take a look. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown Inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's pray. Father, this is a very lengthy passage and it is very rich. And it is leading up to one of the passages that you have provided for us in your word to give us a hope that belies circumstance quite often. And there are many here that are concerned because of what's going on with the weather, and we understand that. We pray, Lord, that as we examine this passage, that you would provide some comfort to those and glorify yourself, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We see in our text that Paul has turned his attention to the future and living in the Spirit. While we're only going to consider through verse 27, the actual Paul's thought continues all the way to verse 30 as he's emphasizing the work of the Spirit in securing us from the moment of our salvation all the way to eternal glory in heaven, providing us all that we need until that day. So now let's be very clear. The Christian life is not easy. Fighting sin, not easy. Enduring persecution in certain areas of the world for your faith, not easy. Coping with day-to-day -day life in a fallen world with corruptible bodies, again, not easy. Nevertheless, Paul says, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Just as there was for Jesus, as it says in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, enduring, uh, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is a joy set before us, a future so wonderful that no matter what you are experiencing right now, better. That no matter what 
circumstance you may find yourself in at any given time during your life, Paul is letting you know what's out there, yet future, is going to be glorious. But not only us, all creation is waiting for us. Look at verse 19 with me. We are not the only ones who will benefit. Paul says that there is a cosmic significance to God's plan being worked out in us, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation not only wants to see us in glory, creation itself will also be blessed when God's plan is brought to its completion. As Paul says in the next verses, for creation was subjected to frustration in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Creation is now in decay. But that is not the way it was supposed to be. At the resurrection, when we are given the glory that Jesus has provided for his children, the world will somehow be freed from its bondage. The entire world will also be redeemed by the work of Jesus Christ. In first, um, pardon me, in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, it says this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. In verses 22 and 23, Paul lets believers know that creation is not alone in its desire for redemption. We have here the first two of three groans. Creation groans along with believers in anticipation of our future redemption. Even though the price has already been paid, we do not yet see everything the way that God wants it. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Creation is burdened. It's in pain. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly Wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Even though we have been given the Holy Spirit as an advance payment on our salvation, Paul points out that for the better part of the last couple of chapters, that we still have struggles. Our salvation and redemption is not yet complete. Redemption of our bodies means they will be made new. No longer subject to decay. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 says, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And we will be transformed into glory. This physical world that we see and that we have great attachment to is not a bunch of junk. The physical world will be tossed aside. Now, I don't understand all of that, but God made it good, and he plans to make it good again. Now, we don't know how our bodies are exactly going to be resurrected. I mean, we don't know. We don't know or understand the specific physics that will be involved in the resurrection and this renewal of the entire world. But we can trust the Creator to complete the work that He began. So we do not yet see a perfect creation, neither in space or in time, or in our own bodies for that matter. But we place our confidence not in us to pull this off, but in him. In verse 24, Paul explains why we can have this confidence. Despite all that we see 
and groan over, God is in control. For in this hope, which hope? That God is in control. We were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope at all. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now there's an obvious tension here. How does one wait eagerly and with patience? We wait both eagerly and patient for the resurrection of our bodies and when our adoption will be completed. But we are now living in what biblical scholars will refer to as already, but not yet. Already redeemed, but not yet completely redeemed. We do not have our glorified bodies. Some of us, our bodies look better than others. But it is not the glorified one that you are promised. We are freed from condemnation, but as been pointed out in the last couple of chapters, we still have a struggle because we haven't been freed yet from sin. We are already in the kingdom, but not in its fullness. We live with aspects of the age to come, and yet we still live with the daily struggles of living here and now. Thankfully, Paul doesn't leave us here. As he starts building momentum towards some of the most theologically rich passages in all of the New Testament, he turns to a third groaning and how we're to navigate this present time, this time between the moment of salvation and our glorification. And he, I think he really does resolve the tension that exists and explains how you can wait eagerly with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. God knows our limitations, frustrations, and our fears. He knows that our flesh is weak even when our spirit is willing. So the Spirit intercedes for us, including those needs that we are incapable of putting into words. This is a great wonder to me. The left brain pragmatic side of me is naturally skeptical of a claim like this. For starters, pride generally keeps me from ever saying words like, helps us in our weakness. If you've been around me in any particular time, any amount of time whatsoever, weakness is not one of the things I want to ever project. However, It's a little bit of self-denial, is it not? Because every one of us have weaknesses. And the text said, in our weakness. Salvation doesn't eliminate your weakness. I wish he did. I wish God had come up with the plan that goes, weakness, gone. But we remain straddled with a fallen Creation. All creation fell with the fall. And we are stuck in that already, but not yet. This is where we're living. We have the completely, the the next bit is the completely unverifiable claim that the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, before I was saved, This was just simply a bridge too far. Okay? Really? I mean, I I remember sitting in church when when this was... Because it's a passage that gets gets a lot of reading. I remember thinking, yeah, right. That dismissive condescension that, unfortunately, I can still do from time to time. It's this whole notion of, really? 
It sort of sounds out there. And my guess is, if you are not a believer this morning, you are thinking something pretty similar to that right this second. Yeah. (laughs) Spirit's going to make the whole thing all well. Yeah, prove that to me. It's part of the conundrum, is it not? Because I said that this verse is a wonder to me. Present tense. Gave my life to Christ. Started living the life. And then you see what you can't see before that moment. A lot of the things that the the skeptic and the um, belligerent non-believer will project. God is God. I mean, he knows exactly who he's saving. He knows exactly the kind of attitudes that you're going to bring to this relationship with him. And immediately I began to understand that I was not the center of the universe. Okay? That everything that I thought, no matter how strongly I thought it, no matter how many successes I may have had in, from a worldly perspective, were meaningless. In our weakness, the spirit, that's the connection you need to see from this passage. It is that we are all straddled with the flesh. I can't fully claim to grasp this matter of the spirit. It is the aspect of our faith that can be challenging. Some embrace it. They come to the faith and they're all in. Yeah, that's great. Trinity, I'm all in. Some less so. And I spent, Sharon and I talked a little bit about this, it's hard for me to convey to you what the better part of 30 plus years in in a Baptist tradition Listening, teaching, studying, and affirming that perspective of Scripture that I agree that for the last hundred years, the Spirit has been intentionally or otherwise marginalized in a lot of those churches. And yet, without the Spirit, as this passage clearly lays out, you can't get there. You cannot live the current life between already redeemed but not completely redeemed. You can't navigate that gap by yourself. I mean, you can try. And I'm living proof that how futile that can be. You get the notion of an understanding of verses like don't grow weary in well-doing because you're trying as hard as you possibly can to live as God would expect you to live as his child. And yet, there it is for you. 22 times 27 verses. You want to get from the sin struggles that you have laid out for you by Paul. Paul himself talking about the wretched man that he is in chapter 7. And where does, how does he run from that? He runs into the arms of the Father. How do you get there? By the Spirit. Because we are still here for his purposes once we're saved. Not our purposes. This whole notion of obedience is soft-pedaled in the West. The whole notion of the English translators cannot make themselves say slave. It's servant. Really? Look at the underlying word. It ain't servant, it's slave. You become, you choose, you have the freedom to choose. You want to understand the roadway to freedom? The roadway to freedom is actually evaluating what God has said about himself, what he has done through his son, and then willingly, by your choice, because remember the definition, it's your choice, right? Your choice is, I'm going with God. And from 
His word, we see obedience is expected. And that's the choice you get to make. But it's still your choice. I really wish God would have allowed, uh, to, he would have just, just decided to have removed weaknesses. Wouldn't that have been super? I mean, Mallory would be jammed up if that was the case. But, you know, if we didn't have any affirmities, nothing, I mean, that would be preferable, would it not? Despite the discrepancy between what we see and what we want, what we can be confident that the Holy Spirit does what we cannot do. He searches our hearts knowing the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Brits have a beautiful way of expressing this with the adverb form of the word proper. If you, if you spend any time listening to the Brits, they're going to say, well, you have a proper job, don't you? You know, and I mean, you're never going to hear that in the States <laughs> unless you're watching the BBC or something. So, proper as in satisfactory and correctly. The Holy Spirit is our guide, helping us, ensuring that our prayers are presented rightly and properly in heaven. Kind of a neat thought, you know, really. You know, you've got, you, you may be in a place today where you're just struggling and something in this life has got you cornered. Okay, and you can't even think straight, you're so jammed up. Isn't it comforting to know that God himself is sorting out everything that's going on inside of you and properly bringing that to the throne room of the Father and saying, here's what's going on in Jaeger's life. Here's what he wants to say, but he doesn't know how to say. You know, we just talked about this a little bit in K-Group last week. When in, in Luke 12, there's a passage where Jesus is just explained to his disciples that they should not fear those that can kill them, but the one who can kill them and toss them into hell. It's the, I mean, this is a pretty significant passage and Jesus is, is he's, it's hard to believe that, that from that comment there's an encouragement in there, but there is because he goes on to explain that they're, they are more, worth more to God than even the sparrows that he still cares about, even though they're almost worthless by that day's standard. And he goes on to finish that passage by say, saying something really important. Because this is the passage where he says that when they are called upon to defend themselves, to defend their faith, they should say, the, Ho the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. How many of you have found yourself and you, you know that a co-worker is, an, is a non-believer or you, you just have a casual acquaintance with somebody who know you, you're perfectly aware of where they stand with respect to the matter of Jesus and, and God and such. It, it, isn't it nice to know that you can approach them without having a track in your pocket? Okay? And I'm not against tracks. Okay? That would be missing the point. Okay? Isn't it really nice and comforting to realize that it is the Holy Spirit that will provide you the words? I can personally attest to this having happened to me on many, many occasions over the last several decades where I had no idea really how to say what I wanted to say and yet in that moment, afterwards, you have the... Have you ever had one of these where afterwards you go, where did that come from? It's not mysterious. It came from the Spirit. What an amazing comfort. From the moment of our salvation, the Spirit is at work sorting everything out for us while we scramble to figure out what it means to live in Christ. In the context that Paul is leading, 
laying out here that, that's leading up to verse 28, I find this is a very humbling truth that we haven't a chance to properly live the Christian life without depending on the Spirit for the obedience that God expects. John had this verse up at the very, on his very last slide last week, and I'm kind of wrapping up here, and it, it reminds us in 1 John 4.4, 4, He who is in you, who's that? The Spirit. He, that sacred deposit, that trust that you have, He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world. John MacArthur had it so very right. We marginalize the Spirit to our detriment. God help us to freely invite Him to guide us through this life and on to glory. Let's pray. Well, Father, such a rich, rich passage. And I pray, Lord, that I have been able to give a glimpse of how the Spirit is the part of your existence that we marginalize to our detriment. That we have no chance whatsoever of living in your will or pleasing to you or in gratitude for the, what your Son has provided for us if we don't understand that it is the Spirit that helps us to navigate this life. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you have done for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for getting us all the way home. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.